Amen. Take your Bibles this morning, if you would, turn with me to John chapter 21. We'll go ahead and dismiss the youth at this time for the youth program in the back. And uh, take your Bibles, again, find John chapter 21. And uh, we'll start at verse 3, we'll read down, not too many verses today, uh, down to verse 7. So starting in chapter 21, John 21. And uh, when you find that, go ahead and stand with me for the reading of God's Word, John chapter 21, starting in verse 3. And this is what it says. It says, Simon Peter saith unto them, I go a fishing. They said unto him, We also go with thee. They went forth and entered into a ship immediately. That night they caught nothing. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. You go back to Luke chapter 5, um, that, that took place again. Uh, earlier in the Gospels, and uh, here we are the, the, towards the end of the Gospel. Of course, Christ has went to the cross. Christ is resurrected, and uh, here's Peter going fishing again. And it says, But when the morning was now come, Jesus stood on the shore. But the disciples knew not that it was Jesus. Then Jesus saith unto them, Children, have ye any meat? They answered him, No. And he said unto them, Cast the net on the right side of the ship, and ye shall find. They cast therefore, and now they were not able to draw it for the multitude of fishes. Therefore that disciple whom Jesus loved saith unto Peter, It is the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he girded his fisher's coat unto him, for he was naked, and did cast himself into the sea. And the others came in a little ship, for they were not far from land, but as it were two hundred cubits dragging the net with fishes. As soon then as they were come uh, to the land, they saw a fire of coals there, and fish there laid thereon and bread. Jesus saith unto them, Bring up the fish which ye have now caught. Simon Peter went up and drew the net to the land full of great fishes, uh, and hundred and fifty and three, and for all there were so many, yet was not the net broken. Jesus saith unto them, Come and dine. And none of the disciples durst ask them, who art thou, knowing that it was the Lord? We'll stop right there. Father, again, we're grateful. And Lord, we pray that you bless us now and give us a good time in your word. And speak to our hearts, Lord, and help us. Again, just, uh, Lord, we're here to worship you. But, Lord, it's more than just that. Uh, Lord, we have so much to learn. There's so much depth in your word and in your character, Lord. And uh, so we come begging to, uh, to know you better and to learn more about you. And so I pray that you speak to our hearts, Lord. And again, if there's someone here tonight or this morning uh, that is not saved, Lord, I pray that you speak to their hearts and help them, Lord, uh, help them realize what they need to do. So bless us now, Lord. We draw this in Jesus' name. You may be seated. This is the second time that we're looking at this account. I've already kind of mentioned that. That this is the second time uh, that the Lord has encountered these men in a very similar setting. Uh, on the, on the, uh, they were on the water, and uh, they were applying at what they thought that they were good at. You could go back to Luke chapter 5. As a matter of fact, I have a couple of verses here in my notes. It says, Now when he had left speaking, he said unto Simon, Launch out into the deep, and let down your nets for a draught. And Simon uh, answering said unto him, Master, we have toiled all the night, and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, uh, I will let down the net. And so we see it's a very familiar setting for Simon. Of course, they had went back to fishing after the rejection that they experienced, uh, um, going to the cross, Christ went to the cross, and of course met them in that uh, little uh, uh, little room. And, and uh, what ended up happening is, of course, here, here Christ has, uh, has uh, come back to them, and visiting them again to encourage them. And uh, we know this as the reinstatement of Peter, uh, where he talked to him three times, uh, or in, in, in encouraged him three times uh, to trust in him. And today what I want to preach about is, uh, can God use you? And uh, this gives us some great insight into uh, to how Christ wants to use us and how we are to, to surrender our will to him. And so, but what we need to realize is this, and I think this will help us in this day and time, we need to get something straight, that, that, that this is God, and God really doesn't need us. 
I mean, when you really think about it, he doesn't need you. I know, I, I know that's kind of hard to say, and uh, it might hurt some feelings, but when we really think about who God is, he really doesn't need us. As a matter of fact, God has never needed mankind. And uh, mankind has always needed God. Would you agree with that? Yeah. That we need God more than he needs us. Our community, our nation needs God. And that uh, we need to be a nation under God. And, and I believe even when the, when the Bible's rightly divided, it shows us early on that God never needed us. And that, that we're, we weren't even, and you might, you might uh, lift your eyebrows at this, and I, I question even on whether to talk about this a lot, but I teach it regularly. And that is, we were really not even God's first choice when you think about it. Did you realize that? And let me show you what I'm talking about, then we'll get into the, the, the message a little bit more. But turn back to Genesis chapter 1 real quick, uh, and let me show you what I'm talking about. Because this will kind of drive home for you, I think, when I say that, 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 that we need God. God doesn't necessarily need us. Now, He wants us to serve Him. He wants to use us. But He can, he can get along without us. Turn back to Genesis chapter 1. And as I said, this might raise your eyebrows, and you might have heard this before, you might not have heard it before. But look at uh, Genesis chapter 1, and look at verse 1 in uh, Genesis chapter 1. And it says, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. And then that verse 2 says something that I never recognized for many years. Um, I got saved when I was 10 years old at Junior Baptist Church, and uh, you've heard my testimony before, many of you have. That when I got saved at Junior Baptist Church, it wasn't, it didn't seem like five, six months later, uh, our family had moved. Gen uh, 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 Junior Baptist Church had a great bus ministry, and uh, we were renting a house from the assistant pastor at Junior, and uh, he came and uh, invited me to, to go to church. And uh, we went, I went to church, I got saved, and it didn't seem like it was long after that, uh, we had moved, and of course I didn't get back into church. And uh, so I got saved, but I didn't grow in the Lord. And so there's things in the Bible that, man, I was, I, I was, I didn't know. Like this, where it says, in the beginning, that Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And so as you read that, many will say, you know, the, the, I've heard people accredit it to, well, he's a gap theorist. No, not at all. Matter of fact, I can prove to you in Scripture that something took place here that many don't catch when you read this. Again, it says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And so what it's showing us here is that when God created the heaven and the earth, something took place between verse 1 and verse 2, then all of a sudden the earth goes from being perfectly created, heaven and earth, to now all of a sudden it lays there without form and without void. Now if you go to study that out, I tell people, what you need is, rather than to listen to what people say, allow the Bible to teach you what it's trying to show you. And so what you do is you compare scripture to scripture. And so what I'm showing you here is, no, it's not the gap theory. Uh, there is no gap theory. The scripture actually fills it in and shows you exactly what took place. And so when you look at that again, can I read it again? In the beginning, God created heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void. Now, wouldn't it be something to think that, just as I said, I've asked a lot of people this, what do you think the main purpose of the Bible is? What do you think the main theme of the Bible is? And a lot of people will say, I'll answer for you, a lot of people would say, well, we believe it's about man's salvation. And I'd say, well, I can show you some things in the Bible that really, man is, you know, we try to make the Bible, uh, we try to do what, uh, we make the man the center of the Bible, and really we're not. Uh, what the Bible is really about is the themes about the battle for the throne. And, and so what we're talking about is good versus evil. And man really is kind of a, a, a second thought. What do you mean by that? Well, look at what it says. It says, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form of void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. What I propose, the Bible shows us, is that something happened between verse 1 and 2, that this earth was created perfect, 
And what happened is, then all of a sudden, this earth is laying without form and void. Now, what happened? Well, I can give you some hints of what happened. Um, we first let's look at uh, look at a major hint right here in uh, chapter one and verse twenty six. And what we're doing is, in, in some might say, well, do you believe in a literal creation? I said, absolutely, I do. I believe in a, a literal uh, uh, six-day, 24-hour day, uh, or a seven-day week. I believe in all that. But I believe also that God gives us some hints that something happened in verse 1, between verse 1 and 2, that, God, that man wasn't the first choice in this earth. Look what it says. It says in verse 26, And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the, uh, all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God, what it says in verse 27, So God created man in his own image, and the image of God created him, male and female created he them. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, be fruitful and multiply. Now, here's the thing. Does so does does that mean that well, does that mean that God that man was God's first choice when He created man? Well, then look what it says. I I didn't read up to that one word. I got underlined in my in my verse twenty eight. It says, and God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. And what's that word? Anybody see it? What's the word? Replenish. It says replenish. Now what's that mean, replenish? It means to refill. When I looked at it, whenever you put it, and I and I I've argued about this, and I said, whenever you put R-E in yeah, the prefix R-E in front of something, it means to redo. And so something's being redone. Now, what are you proposing, Pastor? What are you trying to tell us? Well, when you go back to uh, Genesis chapter 1, in verse 1 it says, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Something happened between verse 1 and 2. Anybody ever heard this? Anybody ever said, this is the gap theory. Let me show you what the Bible says about it. First thing you would look at is, and what, what I tell everybody to do is, rather than listen to a commentary, Rather than listen to what somebody else says, rather than go by conventional teachings, why not let the Bible teach you what it means? Why not rightly divide the Bible like the Bible teaches us to do? How do we rightly divide? It? Well, one of the things the Bible says is to, is to use Scripture to interpret Scripture. So how can I take verse 1 and 2 and interpret Scripture with Scripture? Well, what I did is I looked at that verse 2 and I said, what, is there some terms in there that's used somewhere else in the Bible? You know what I found? It says, in the earth was without form and void. What does that mean to be without form and void? Well, you look at some commentaries, and a lot of them will say, well, that just means it was the kind of like, like the pre-creation ball, uh, muddy earth as God was creating it. No. Verse, because verse 1, if I'm to take my Bible literally, verse 1 says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. It was done. And so all of a sudden here, it says the earth was without form and void. It laid in ruins. If you look at what without form and void means, it means it was ruined. Not, lay, not in, not in the, the process of being created. It had been created and in ruins. So how can you prove that? Well, you go by Scripture. And so what I did is I found where one other time that without form and void is used. You know where it's used at? Anybody know? Jeremiah chapter 4. Turn there with me. Real quick. Jeremiah chapter 4. Now this is kind of just a prelude to what I'm preaching about this morning. And that is, can God use you? And God doesn't need you, but he wants to use you. And so look at Jeremiah chapter 4. And uh, I want to show you something. Jeremiah chapter 4, and lo and behold, what you're going to find is there's those very same terms. You ever heard the, the term, uh, the rule of first mention? Well, what you'll find out is uh, many times when God uses something, he starts to reveal something. And then, then what will happen is he'll use it again in Scripture and give a little bit more understanding. Sometimes it works one way and sometimes it works the other. 
But look at Jeremiah chapter 4 and look at, look at um, about verse, start about verse 14. Now, what do we know about Jeremiah? Jeremiah was a prophet. Jeremiah was sent to the Jews. Of course, we know the, the Jews are God's chosen nation. He, they, are, they are his chosen nation all the way back from Genesis chapter 12. And what God would do, and of course, they didn't have a completed Bible at that time. How God would communicate with mankind at that time is he would come to a prophet. And that prophet would go to the people and tell them what God had said. And, and that's much of the way of how our Bible has come to be. It's through mankind and God telling them, record these words. And after you speak them, record them. And, and so here we have Jeremiah. He was a prophet. Matter of fact, he was called the weeping prophet. And he wept for, for the Jews. And one, one thing you'll notice about the Jews, they were constantly going through a cycle. And that is they would get close to God and then they'd get away from God. They'd start following, and uh, they would do wonderful. God would be blessing them, and then all of a sudden they'd turn from God, turn to other gods. And what would happen is God would allow other nations to chastise them and judge them. And then they would cry out in, uh, to God and say, God, please save us, and God would come back around. And, uh, of course, they were the ones doing the cycling, not God. God was always there, but they would walk away from God. And here's one of those times where... Israel, the nation of Israel, is away from God. And what it says here in Jeremiah chapter uh, 4, verse 14, O Jerusalem, wash thine heart from wickedness. We can see the mentality of Israel. He says, O Jerusalem, wipe, uh, wash thine heart from wickedness, that thou might, mayest be saved. How long shall thy vain thoughts lodge within thee? For a voice declared from Dan and publisheth affliction from Mount Ephraim. And it says, Make ye mention to the nation, Behold, publish, uh, publish against Jerusalem that watchers come from far country and give out their voice against the cities of Judah. And so what I'm doing is kind of giving you a picture of, of Israel and the kind of condition they're in spiritually with God. And God's chastising them through Jeremiah. He's, he says, Jeremiah, go tell them this. And then look at what it says. Verse 21, skip on down. We won't read all that. He says, how long shall I see the standard and hear the sound of the trumpet? For my people is foolish. They have not known me. They are sottish children. They have, they have not understanding. They are, uh, they are wise to do evil, but to do good, they have no knowledge. And then look at verse 23. There's some terms there that should be familiar to you. They're the same terms that were used back in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2. And it says, I beheld the earth, and lo, it was without form and void, and heavens, and they had no light. I beheld the mountains. Now, what it's going to do is God's giving us a little bit more insight what it means when he says something is, is void without form and void. What does it mean to be without form and void? It means it's laying destroyed. Look at the descriptions. I beheld the mountains, and lo, they trembled, and all the hills moved lightly. I beheld, and lo, there was no man, and all the birds of the heavens were fled. It means there was birds there one time. Does that mean there were men there one time? In other words, what are you trying to show us? That in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 and 2, before man was even, uh, before man even created us, there had been something before. You be the judge. Look at what the scripture says. I behold, I behold, and lo, there was no man, and all the birds of heaven were fled. I beheld, and lo, the fruitful place was a wilderness, and all the cities thereof were broken down. Are you telling us that in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, there were cities? That's what it says here. When it's defining what, what to be without form and void is, if I'm to believe literally what God's word says, why would God use that term back there? To describe something and give us the uh, give us more description of what that meant. Why would he say that if it wasn't so? So look what it says. It says, "I beheld and lo, the fruitful place was a wilderness, 
and all the cities there were broken down as the presence of the Lord, and by his fierce anger, for thus hath the Lord said, The whole land shall be desolate, yet will I not make it full end. So what I propose is going on here is in Jeremiah, Jeremiah was threatening Israel and saying, you guys are wicked and you're away from God. And God's telling me to tell you this, that if you do not come back under God, God's going to do to you like he did back in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2. He's, gonna, he's going to wreck you, but it promises that God will not make a full end. So in other words, what he, and God, do you know this? God always told Israel there will always be a remnant. And so what I'm showing you here is when we look at that Genesis chapter 1, uh, 1 and 2, we see that God created a perfect earth, and in verse 2, he destroyed it for some reason. And it says there were cities. If we're to believe what the scripture says and compare it, it says there were cities, there were walls broken down, and so if there were cities, there had to be men who would have built them. Or mankind, some kind of man. Again, it says, I beheld, and lo, there was no man, and all the birds of the heavens were fled. I beheld, and lo, the fruitful place was the wilderness, and all the cities thereof were broken down at the presence of the Lord, and by the fierce anger, for thus hath the Lord said, the whole land shall be desolate, yet will I not make a full end. For this shall the earth, uh, earth mourn. You know what was going on back here? Turn back to Genesis chapter 1. I propose, according to Scripture, that the earth that he had created in verse 1 and verse 2 was laying in mourning. The earth had been destroyed and was laying there mourning. Not, not mourning like a.m., but mourning as in weeping and mourning. You see? Now, what do you propose happened, preacher? Well, Scripture shows us. Turn to Ezekiel chapter 28. Look what it says. Again, this is just preemptive of what I'm going to preach on this morning. But Ezekiel chapter 28, look what it says. There's two places in the Scriptures that talk about this particular character. It's Ezekiel chapter 28 and Isaiah chapter 14. And they both complement each other and fill in the blanks. Mm -hmm. Ezekiel 28 verse 13 says, uh, it says in verse 13, Thou hast been in Eden. Hmm. What do you mean you have? It, has, it says, Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering. The sardis, the topaz, the diamond, the barrel, the ounce, the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, the carbuncle, the gold, the workmanship, and the tablets, and the pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou was created. Where's, where's Eden at? Here on earth or in heaven? It's that here on earth. Now, who's this talking about? This is a, a, a double prophecy, so to speak. It speaks both backwards and forwards. And what's going on here is it talk, it's talking about Satan. And it's talking about his original position. Anybody know what Satan was before he actually became the fallen angel? Lost his body and became the prince and power of the air? You had her angel. Well, it wasn't an archangel. There's differences. You gotta look at what it says. Thou art the anointed cherub. I did a little study and I figured out what an anointed cherub is. You know what a cherub does? Pretty easy to figure out. You know where, the, you know where there's always two cherubs in the temple and how they, they stand over the ark? You know what they're doing? They're looking at that ark. They act as almost like a guard. And so when I studied out that anointed cherub, what Satan was put down here for was as a covering cherub. He was guarding the earth. That's what he was created for. Says he was in Eden, but you know what's funny? He shows up again in Eden in Genesis chapter 3, but he doesn't look like this. He's not covered in wonderful jewels and all that kind of stuff. What he is there is a, anybody know what he is in, in Eden? Yeah, he's a serpent. He's a serpent. And so here he is, the most beautiful image, a, an anointed cherub. A cherub is a four-winged creature. 
And what you see is that here he is a cherub, and he's in Eden. Now, what, what a lot of guys will do, a lot of commentaries will do, they'll, they'll trip over themselves to try to render this out of the Bible. Because they don't want to believe what I teach. They don't want to believe what the Bible teaches. And that is, there's no gap theory. It's perfectly, it's perfectly given for us right here. It's not a gap theory. What it is, is it, said, it shows us that what happened between in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, earth was perfectly formed, and then all of a sudden in verse 2, it's without form and void, it's laying in ruins, is because that original earth was covered by a cherub, guarded by a cherub. And what had happened is, read on in Ezekiel 28, it says, Thou art the anointed chair that covereth, and I have set thee so, thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Anybody ever studied out the holy mountain of God? You know where that's at? It's, it's always physical. It's never in heaven. It's always here on earth. You know where it's at? It's in Jerusalem. It's always, it's in Jerusalem. The holy mountain of God is in Jerusalem. It's where the temple's going to be. It's where the, 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 the uh, throne's going to be. And so it says here, Thou art the anointed chair that covereth. I have set thee as thou was upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Where is that at? It's here on earth. Look at any mention that it talks about it, and it's always earthly. Thou was perfect in thy ways from the day that thou was created till, uh, till iniquity was found in thee. By the multitude of thy merchandise, they have filled the midst of thee with violence, and thou hast sinned. Therefore, I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God, and I will destroy thee. Now, so what you're telling us, preacher, is that the original, the original earth was guarded by Satan. Yes, but he wasn't Satan. He was, he was, he was Lucifer, the anointed cherub. Anybody know what the anointed cherub is now? When, when Lucifer, and it says it in Scripture what happened, he lost his body. And what, what did he become? If you look at Ephesians chapter 2, it tells you exactly what he became. I'll read it for you. Ephesians chapter 2. Now, why are you showing us all this? Well, because it kind of plays into what I wanted to preach to you this morning. Ephesians chapter 2. Listen to this. It says... And you hath he quickened, talking about those that have gotten saved. And you hath he quickened who are dead in trespasses and sins. Where in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the, no longer the anointed chair. Now who Satan is, who, the, who Lucifer became, was the prince of the power of the air. You know what, you know what the anointed chair of is now? You know what Satan is now? He's a spirit. He's the prince and power of the air. The spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. So, Pastor, preacher, how do you explain in Genesis chapter 3 where he shows up in the Garden of Eden there? What he did there is he was already a spirit. And what he had to do is commandeer a body. He doesn't have a body. He's, a, he's the prince of the power of the air. He's a spirit. And what he does is he has to possess something. To be able to, to have, a, have a physical presence in front of somebody that's physical, he has to possess something. What did he possess? Back there in Genesis chapter 3, it's very simple. Genesis chapter 3 says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field. Well, I wonder why that serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field. Because he was possessed by a spirit that was originally created as the covering cherub. And it says, it says, and the first thing that he did is he said, and he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said. First thing he started doing is attacking God. Amen. So what I said is this. Really, we're not the center of this Bible. What we are is, yes, we have been created. Yes, we have a special uh, use with God. And yes, we have a special relationship with God created in his image. But, but we didn't start out in this Bible. Matter of fact, when you look at it, what you'll see is that we came, we kind of were a second thought. 
You look at that again in, in, uh, in verse, now that to me, I don't know about you, but if you mark that replenish in your Bible, that makes you look totally different at that word. Now I know what you've heard. A lot of people say, well that's a misfortunate mistranslation. Unfortunate mistranslation. Anybody ever told you that your King James Bible has been mistranslated? All the time. You know why? Because you got Satan saying, Yea, hath God said. He's attacking God's word constantly. And the last thing he wants you to do is see the full picture. And, and I said all that to say, but God can use us. Even though, I, you know, it seems kind of harsh, Pastor, that you sit there and you tell us that we were, weren't even really God's first choice. Well, I'm sorry. But I, I choose to believe what the Bible says. And I choose to believe that something happened, and we pretty well can clearly see what happened. If you'll write down Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 28, and Jeremiah 4, you'll be able to piece it together. It's right there. As clear as day. But we have a purpose. And what I want to ask you this morning is, will you let God use you for your purpose? Amen. Now, where are we going here? Well, when we look at what we read this uh, this morning. Turn back again, again, if you would. And I want you to see some. Matter of fact, turn back even farther to Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter 5. I want to go to the original account where, where God was dealing with Peter and his, those that were fishing with him. Luke chapter 5. And it says, And it came to pass... That as the people pressed upon him to, to hear the word of God, he stood by the lake of Gennesaret and saw two ships standing by the lake. But the fishermen were gone out of them and were washing their nets. And he entered into one of the ships, which was Simon's, and, and, and it says, Pray him that he would thrust out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the people out of the ship. So what he did is he, he commandeered Peter's ship. And he preached out of Peter's ship. And almost as a, as a payment for Peter letting him use his vessel. Then he gives him a blessing. Look what it says. Verse 4, Now when he had left speaking, he said unto, unto Simon, Launch out into the deep, and let down your nets for a draught. And Simon answering said unto him, Master, we have toiled all the night, and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word I will let down the net. And when they, had, when they had this done, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes and their net break. And so what we can see is that, that Peter was blessed because he allowed Christ to use his vessel. And my challenge this morning is what it really boils down to, who is willing to be used of God? Are you willing to be used of God? And what is God looking for? If you're willing to be used of God, what is God looking for? Well, the first thing we can see there is, in verse 3 again, it says, He entered into one of the ships, which was Simon's, and prayed him that he would thrust out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the people on the ship. And so what I would challenge you with is the first thing that God wants to know is, can God use you? Amen. And thank God, God is willing to stoop down to us and use us. First of all, a miraculous work has to, has to take place. You know what the Pharisees' problem was in the Bible many times? Is they thought they could make themselves fit for God's use. Whenever you look at what, the, what it says about the Pharisees, their problem is they believe in self-righteousness. That's their whole problem. They always believe that they can make themselves fit for his use. But you, have you ever seen what Christ said about them? I got some verses in my notes. Matthew 23, 25 says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you make clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. Thou blind Pharisee, cleanse first that which is within the cup and platter that the outside of them may be clean also. 23, 28, Matthew says, Even so ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within ye are full of hypocrite, uh, hypocr hypocrisy, and iniquity. See, and that, what has to happen, if we're going to, 
to make ourselves fit for God's use, a miraculous work has to be done before you're fit to serve. And, and did you know there's two types of, of people in this world? It, well, it's this black and white, it really is. That there's, there's those that are righteous. Now, you know what righteousness means? I know that, that kind of, it always used to kind of just irk me when you thought about that word, righteous. But then I realized, you know what righteousness means? It doesn't mean anything I've done. It means what God has done for me. Righteousness, I, when I define righteousness for people, I tell people it simply means that you're right with God. That's all it is. Righteousness is no more, no less than being right with God. And see, the problem with the Pharisees is they thought they could make themselves righteous. You know, they, were, they polished everything. And that's probably why we have, a, have kind of a, a slanted look at righteousness when we hear, you think you're righteous. No. I don't think I'm righteous. I think I'm right with God. I've done what I need to do to get saved and to be right with Him. So righteous, the best way to define it is to be right with God. Now, how to be right with God can be explained by the other type of vessel. We already turned there once, but if you can't keep there where you're at in Luke chapter 5, and turn with me to Ephesians chapter 2 again. Because there's, there's those vessels that are right with God and then there's those others. There's only two in this world. And you're one or the other. Where it boils down to. It says in, in chapter 2 again, verse, uh, verse 2 it says, Where in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince and power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. You either, you know what it boils down to? And this is pretty harsh. You either have the spirit of God in you, or you have the spirit of the devil. One way or the other. It's the only way it is. It's only two people. You either have the spirit of God in you or you have the spirit of the devil. There's no in between. There's none of this. Well, he's a good person, but... No, it's one way or the other. Again, it says in verse 2, Where in the time past you walk according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Now... You might say to yourself, I'm not a child of disobedience. You are if you've never, if you've never surrendered to the gospel of Jesus Christ, you're a child of disobedience. Now, I do believe there is a time of ignorance there. Let me be, let me be frank with you. There is, has anybody ever shown you in uh, Romans chapter 7 that there is a time, we call it, Oh, I'm slipping, the word's slipping out of my mind. We call it uh, the age of accountability. You ever seen it shown to you? You know, people throw that term around, but nobody can ever show you in Scripture. I can show it to you in Scripture. Romans chapter 7, verse 9. Paul spoke of it. Look at Romans chapter 7, verse 9. It says, now I'm throwing a lot at you this morning. Romans chapter 7, verse 9. It says this. For I was alive without the law once. You know who's, you know who's saying this? Uh, Romans. Who wrote Romans? Uh, Paul. So Paul's saying it. Now, what I would say to myself is, Paul, when were you alive before the law? When, I mean, you don't go back as far as Moses. Moses is the one that got the Ten Commandments. When were you ever alive without the law? You weren't. But he says he was. Says... For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived, and I died. You, ain't, you didn't die, did you, Paul? You're not dead. No, you know, what he, you know what he was? He was dead in sin. Just like that Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2 talks about. What you're seeing there is Paul talking about the age of accountability. Now, is there a specific age? I've heard people say, 12 years old. No. <laughs> It can be whatever, whenever you, really, whenever you hear the law and realize you're a sinner and don't do something about it, there's where the age of accountability stops. I've seen kids get saved at five. I've seen kids get saved at 10. I've seen adults get saved at 25, 65. Grandpa Leonard got saved at 92. Now, does that mean that he had reached the age of accountability? Well, he reached some kind of grace. Because 
God, God kept being safe until it was 92, until he got saved. And so what I, what I preach and teach people is this. There is an age of accountability. That you can have children, you can even have adults that are safe until they realize that they're a sinner. Until, uh, until uh, it says, for I was alive without the law once. When was Paul alive without the law? For him, it was probably when he was a child. For him, it was probably before he started going to the Phar Pharisaic school. But once he realized he was a sinner, that's what he's talking about. What's the, what's the law do? You know what the law does? It, con it convicts you of your sin. It's our school teacher. It's to teach us that we're sinners. <clears throat> that's what he's talking about right here. He says, for I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived. When I realized what the law was talking about and it convicted me of my sin, I died. Amen. 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 I died. And so what we're talking about here is there's only two types of people. Those that have the spirit of God in them. And those that have, the, the, those that have the spirit of the devil. And there is a time where there's a safe time. But usually it's those that are ignorant of their sin. And when they, when they realize they're sinners, that's why one of the first things we do with these kids when they come back to Sunday school is we're teaching them about sin and how, they re how they're going to realize that they're a sinner. And we don't force them. We don't say, ABC, repeat after me. We're waiting for them to come to this realization to where, where that law makes them aware of their sin. I can't do it for them. Amen. God's Word does. That's the power in God's Word. You see. And so, just as I said, can God use your vessel? One of the first requirements, of course, is you got to be a saved vessel. you got to be right with God. you got to make yourself right with Him. How can I do that? It's simple. Three simple verses. Romans 3.23. For all of sin come short of the glory of God. Paul says, someday that law is going to come to you and convict you of your sin. And on that day that it happens, you're going to realize you're a sinner. For all of sin come short of the glory of God. We're all sinners. And what you're going to realize is, just like what that scripture is talking about, that we have a sin wage to pay. Romans 6.23 says, for the wages sin is death. We're talking about it right there. For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. But the good news is this. The rest of that verse, Romans 6, 23, for the ways of sin is death, but you thought we rehearsed that. Carl always interrupts to finish my verses. <laughs> But that's exactly the truth. Right there. So, and then what I tell people is it's this simple. Because a lot of people say, well, I, now I realize I'm a sinner. Now I realize that I have a sin wage to pay. What am I supposed to do? Romans 10, 13. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's how simple it is. So I wanted only two kinds of people in this world. Saved ones lost ones. One two, type, two types of people in this world. Those with the spirit of Christ in them, those with the spirit of the Antichrist. It's what the Bible says, right? What it says. Ephesians chapter 2, you have to look back over there again. Ephesians chapter 2 says, where in the time past ye walked according to the course of this word, according to the prince of power of the air, the spirit that will now worketh in the children of disobedience. You're a child of disobedience if you've never trusted in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you're going to call it him. I'm not saying that to be me. I'm saying that to show you exactly what the Bible says about how to get saved. Because the good news is Christ went to that cross for us. Mm -hmm. Amen. He shed his blood for our sin. He paid that sin wage for us. And what's amazing is when we did this in Sunday school. I said, isn't it amazing that people will, people will actually think, God, how could God put his own son on the cross? Well, if you realize who his son was, that what the scripture shows you is that God didn't put his son, he put himself on that cross. 
God has the, the ability to both be himself and his son and his own Holy Spirit. It's called the Godhead. It's how simple it is. So God put himself on the cross to pay your sin range. And so, and so God makes it so easy for us to be used of him. He went to the cross and died for us. You see. And what's amazing is here he is showing Peter a second time. We read that in John 21. Where God comes in the form of man is Jesus Christ. And says, cast that net on the other side. You haven't caught anything? And he wants to use their vessel. He wants to use our vessel. And so, so our challenge is, will you heed God's command? Look at, uh, back there in, in uh, Luke chapter 4, I mean, sorry, Luke chapter 5, verse 4. Look what it says. It says, now, when he had left speaking, he said unto Simon, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a draught. And look at what Simon does. And Simon answering said unto him, Master, we have toiled all the night. You know what he did? He kind of argued with Christ. He argued with God himself. He argued with Emmanuel. What's Emmanuel mean? God with yes. us. So God came to form a man, and what does Peter do? He argues with him. And, and when I, why I say that is because are you willing to heed God's command? Because what a lot of people do, they'll hear it plain as day on how to get saved and how to allow God to use their vessel. And what they'll do is they'll argue. Or they'll put it off. Or they'll say, well, I, I, don't, I can't tell you the number of times I've knocked someone's door and I've showed them the gospel just as plain as what I've showed you. And they'll sit there and go, well, that makes sense, but I believe, I believe I can, I believe you do it this way. I believe I can be a good person and still go to heaven. I don't believe, I believe, I've never killed anybody, so I believe that someday when I stand before God and be judged, that he'll say, he'll let me in because. You know what they're doing? They're arguing. That's what God was. Yeah, they're arguing. That's exactly what Peter was doing. He says, but what Peter did is he relented very soon. Because when, when Christ asked him to, uh, uh, to cast out, launch out for a draught, Peter said, well, we've been, we've been fishing all night. There ain't no fish out there. It's not a good time for it. And right now is the worst time. But nevertheless, he says, and so our challenge is the same thing. When you hear what to do to be saved, or when you hear what to do to be used of God, I challenge you not to argue with him. Amen. And then finally, look at, uh, and this probably has more to do with many of us here, because many of you probably have the testimony of being saved. And you can say, well, I've done it. I've heard all this. Well, that's wonderful. But then look at what else we need to do if we're going to allow God to use our best, if we're going to allow God to use us. Because then you read the rest of that verse, uh, verse 4 in Luke chapter 5. On down through verse 11, it says, And Simon answered and said unto him, Master, we have told all the night, and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, thy word I will let down the net. And when they had this done, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes, and their net break. And they beckoned unto their partners, which were in the other ship, that they should come and help them. And they came and filled both ships. So that they began to sink. And when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a simple man, O Lord. For he was astonished, and all that were with him, at the draught of the fishes which they had taken. And so was also James and John, son of Zebedee, which were partners with Simon. And Jesus said unto Simon, Fear not, from henceforth thou shalt catch men. And when they had brought their ships to land, they forsook all and followed him. And so what that really talks about is you might be sitting here this morning and you say, now I've heard all this. I've saved, I've trusted in Christ. Then what I'd say is this, then are you willing to go that next step? And that is to surrender yourself to him. That is, that is, are you willing 
to surrender to his control. Because they surrendered. Once they saw who he was and what he did, then it says in that last verse, and when they had brought their ships to land, they forsook all and followed him. Amen. Now, the amazing thing is we can sit here and say, well, I've done that. Praise the Lord. But you know what? It's awful easy to slip back. Because that same group that he was talking to there, the reason I read John 21, is that same group went back to them, their ways. Amen. And so what happened is they got to a point where they took back over. They weren't surrendered to his control. And of course you see Christ come back into their life and say, three times he said it to Peter, Peter, you love me. You know I do. Peter. I mean, you can go through the about Peter and all that kind of stuff. And what he was doing is nailing Peter to the corner. And what's amazing is to see what their life was like after that. Amen. The difference he made. And so I challenge you this morning, I don't know, only you know, are you saved? Have you made yourself your one your one of two? Yeah, your one of two. And have you ever made yourself one of the whosoever's? The God's love Lord gives only begotten something who shall believe in him shall not perish by having everlasting life. The only two choices. You might be sitting here saying, Yes, I know that I'm one of those whosoever's. Then what my next challenge would be. Are you surrendered to me? Have you got away from me? We believe in biblical salvation. What's that? Well, they call it once saved, always saved. I don't like using the term because it brings negative connotations from people out in this world. So what we call is biblical salvation. Eternal security. You can be eternally saved, but not serving. And that's kind of what we saw with John, in the end of John, with Peter, you see. So that's our challenge. Amen. Father, we're grateful, Lord. I pray that you bless us. I pray that you speak to our hearts this morning. And uh, Lord, we, we practice a, an invitation. And uh, Lord, if there's someone here this morning, Lord, that number, we, we, we touched on a couple of things. One is about salvation. How to get saved. Lord, how, how we're to realize that we're sinners and we're all in need of salvation. And although there is a safe period in our life, that when we get to that point where we realize that we're sinners and that we need to be saved, then we're challenged to make a, make a step. And if there's someone here this morning that has never made that step, that has never trusted in what you did on the cross for us. Because we know salvation can only come to